on the scene He's got the voice that's mean Asking those questions that you never seen He's got that fire Burning bright and clean Andrew Keen Making waves Break the routine On the keen on show He brings the heat Asking the minds Digging deep till they bleed No sugar coated truths No lies to deceive Andrew Keen The master of the interview beat the knowledge he's got the flair challenging ideas with a fearless stare with every question he's uncovering what's there andrew key the true seeker he's aware hello everybody it is said probably by winston churchill since most of most repeated uh, quotes are from him that history is written by the victors that we know our history because uh they're written appropriately enough by the people who have won and the losers don't have a voice in history. Although I'm not sure my guest today, Kathleen Duval, who teaches history at uh, the University of North Carolina and is the author of an intriguing new book, Native Nations, a Millennium in North America, would agree. She is joining us from Durham. Uh, Kathleen, that phrase I'm sure you're familiar with. Is there any truth to it? And uh, if it is indeed true, why should we be concerned with the history of, of Native Americans who, of course, were the, the big losers in the European colonization of North America? Well, I think, you know, history trends come and go, and there are some eras in which uh, the histories are written all from the perspective of the victor. And there are some eras, like I think the one we're living in, where it's it's not that much, where people are interested in a, a, a lot of different stories. Maybe one of the questions is why some people won and other people's lo people lost. But uh, but I think people are a lot of people are interested in in both sides of that, and, and also in, in you know maybe things that aren't quite as clear as as one side won and one side lost. And so I think Native Americans in the United States in other parts of the Americas, um, they lost a lot. You know, they lost a lot of land, they lost a lot of sovereignty. Many of them lost their lives. But one of the things I talk about in the book is, is how did they manage to retain what they did retain despite so much loss? And, um, and how did they survive today in the United States? There are almost 600 um, federally recognized tribes, tribes that are recognized as nations by, by the US government. And so you know, one of the, um, one of the things that, that I'm interested in is, is how did they keep that much at least? How did they keep their communities? How did they keep some of their sovereignty in the midst of all this loss? You've written extensively on this, many books. Uh, people will be familiar with your book, Independence Lost, Lives on the Edge of the American uh, Revolution, also The Native Ground. Um, do you think, Kathleen, that we're living at a time where interest in Native Americans is a little bit more fashionable. It seems for a while, and, and you're the authority, of course, here, that perhaps for a couple of hundred years, people had no interest one way or the other in, 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 in the culture and history of Native Americans. Mm -hmm. Today, there's more and more interest, maybe a degree of guilt, but also it reflects mm -hmm. some of the, the problems with contemporary America. Yeah, I think that's right. Um, I think Americans have always had some interest in Native Americans, but it's been uh, probably less interest in in their actual history and more in, in sort of an idealized view of them, um, and particularly a view of them as, as only existing in the past. And so I think um, today, one of the reasons that many Americans and, and people beyond the United States, I hope, are interested in Native American history is that Native Americans are still around. And so you can see Native Americans on TV and in the movies, and there've been some, some really big US Supreme Court cases lately involving Native nations and, uh, and you know, in modern art and all kinds of things that show that Native Americans are still here today. Um, and I think a lot of Americans at least, and, and I think beyond that sort of, that doesn't, that doesn't fit well with what little they know about Native Americans as, as being people who, uh, who lost, right, who, and maybe who, who completely died off, or at least whose cultures died off long ago in the past, um, none of which is quite true. Um, and and that, that's why Native Americans still are here today and why they're still members of, of separate Native nations today. So the, the subtitle of, of the new book, Native Nations, is A Millennium mm -hmm. 
in North America, a uh, thousand years in North America. Is that how long most of the so-called Native Americans were on this continent before the Europeans showed up? No, no, they were here tens of thousands of years. Um, so this is just a, a few hundred years of those, you know, of those last centuries that they were here before Europeans and Africans and Asians began coming here. Um, and, and then the 500 plus years that, that Europeans have been here as well as Native Americans. But um, you know, a longer history could be written of, of Native Americans here. And, and sort of, I think you know, that's sort of in some ways the realms beyond those of historians um, for those that you know, it's uh, well over 10,000 years and archeologists keep finding new sites that show that Native Americans have been here longer and longer. So even when I, I teach my class and the first day of class, I talk about how long Native Americans have been here and I actually have to keep revising that lecture every year because archeologists are finding a longer and longer human presence here. Yeah, it's interesting. I can't remember the name of the author. We had her on the show a year or two ago ago a kind of cultural anthropologist who wrote a book about the Bering Straits uh, yeah. uh, and uh, certainly yeah it's more than a thousand years ago so if my math is right Kathleen <laughs> and this is an easy calculation uh, a thousand years ago in 1024 uh, there were of course no quote-unquote Europeans here give us a snapshot uh, mm -hmm. I, I know that's a, a rather uh, um, gross question for a, a, a sophisticated historian like yourself. But if if we had the, the good or the bad fortune to find ourselves in North America in 1024, mm -hmm. what would we see? Well, there were many, many urban civilizations across North America. And that's, that's one of the things that I think most people don't know. Um, there were large agriculture-based um, cities um, with, with large regions where they had farms and, and uh, suburbs um, in the Mississippi Valley. So in what's now the southeastern United States into the northeastern United States um, and west of the Mississippi River. Um, and then also in what's now the American Southwest, Arizona and New Mexico, um, large urban uh, agriculture based civilizations. Um, that uh, that relied on extensive irrigation systems, um, and many of these. You know, it's hard to say much about you know daily life in those places that we don't have much information about. But many of them had quite powerful leaders. Um, you know what Europeans would have called kingdoms, uh, kings, and, and uh, sort of religious priests. Um, um, and it really was in many places, certainly not all, but in many places, especially the places where corn grows well, um, it was a, a, a region of, very, of quite centralized, certainly centralized relative to places like Western Europe at the time, urbanized relative to Western Europe at the time, um, civilizations. So if one was to generalize again, uh, obviously everybody needs to read your book to get beyond these rather gross, uh, gen crass generalizations. But was the, the North America in 1024 not essentially different from the Europe of 1024? Were there profound technological differences with differences in warfare, in literacy? Most of those differences come later. Um, I think it's quite surprising how if you look at 1054, there is a huge amount of similarity. Um, one of the reasons that there's a lot of similarity between Western Europe and North America, and I'm talking about north of north of central Mexico um, at the time, was that they had experienced climate changes that were quite similar in the two places. Um, it was the period of that um, that's called the medieval warm period. And it was a time when the, as the name implies, the the planet had warmed. And what that really meant, particularly for the latitudes in the Northern Hemisphere that Western Europe, much of Western Europe and much of North America are along, that meant that there was a longer growing season and um, more predictable weather than certainly the climate period that came after that and probably the climate period that came before that. And that in both places, those climate changes allow the spread of agriculture and particularly the growth of these civilizations with large scale 
grain and other agriculture that allow the growth of cities um, and, and the um, the creation of the kind of classes that uh, of people who didn't grow food for their living, who, who's, who's, whose food, who, who's, you know, in most civilizations before that, probably most people had spent most of their time producing food. Um, and the medieval warm period allowed in both of these regions for uh, for an era that wasn't like that, where where there were people who could be artisans or priests or um, other sorts of jobs that didn't require gr growing or hunting um, food all of the time. Um, and the sort of scale of the size of cities, um, the trade networks between cities, um, really quite similar um, at the time between Western Europe and uh, and North America. There, there may be an opportunity for a counterfactual. What if these native nations had been the ones that colonized Western Europe? Then mm -hmm. certainly the history of the world would have been quite different. That's right. Yeah. My assumption, and again, it's a very amateurish assumption, Kathleen, is that the more sophisticated uh, nations, indigenous nations of of the Americas existed in, in Central and what we now call Latin America. Is that wrong? Yeah, that's what a lot of people think. That's what most uh, most textbooks and many, many historians have always said. Um, but I think if we sort of take ourselves back to that 1054, um, that's not true. Um, there are civilizations all across what's now Northern Mexico and at least say the Southern two thirds of what's now the United States um, that had um, adopted corn agriculture from central Mexico. It, it starts for this region, it starts in central Mexico. Um, so you could say it was more advanced or farther along in that way. Um, but um, the, the similar technologies, similar ways of life had spread all across this region. Um, that, that sort of perspective comes from the fact that when Europeans arrive, by the time Europeans start arriving at the very end of the 1400s and in the 1500s, um, Central Mexico is still urbanized, centralized, um, with very powerful and wealthy um, monarchs, lords, uh, um, ruling the cities of Central Mexico. And it's not that way to the north anymore. There's been a huge change by um, the end of the 1400s in North America, north of Central Mexico. Um, those ancient civilizations, the centralized urban areas have fallen and in their place are, I, I would say, equally sophisticated, but not nearly as centralized um, societies that are more, um, more democratic, more focused on a, um, Back, back to spending more time on food, right? Um, but, but more egalitarian, and that to Europeans look primitive. Europeans don't know the long urban history; um, they don't know the period uh, of, of climate change. Uh, there's another set of climate changes moving into the Little Ice Age in the 1200s, and starting in the 1200s. That that probably is the main reason why people in North America, north of Central Mexico, um, decentralize, change their economies, and uh, along with that, some of their their politics and and their sort of social socioeconomic structures. Um, but then Europeans arrive and think that's primitive, think they've never had anything else, and also don't understand sort of the sophistication of their economies that combine agriculture and hunting and gathering. I want to take a break in a second, Kathleen, and talk about the European period, their arrival, and the consequences for natives, for the for Native Americans. But before we get there, one other question: the the Europeans, or the the common conception of Europeans as colonialists, as victors, were twofold. Firstly, that these native peoples didn't have sophisticated European notions of things like private property but also the representation of Native Americans as in a Rousseauan sense of simple, primitive, happy people, mm -hmm. uh, hunters and gatherers mm -hmm. who spent their lives enjoying the fruits of North America mm -hmm. uh, without any of the, the downside of civilization. Are, are both of those wrong? Um, yeah, so the um, the there is so Europeans are right when they get to North America and see that there isn't, you know, in most cases, and again, we're generalizing, there aren't um, huge uh, differences of class and um, 
Uh, there aren't, you know, most places that Europeans go, at least to starting in the 1600s, there aren't huge armies. Um, there are all kinds of things that Europeans have come to think by the 1500s and 1600s are signs of civilization that Native North Americans don't have or don't have anymore. Um, but one of the things that, um, that sort of political scientists have studied and anthropologists as well, um, and, and one of the things that I sort of learned as I was writing this book was how complicated it can be to run a, a society that, that emphasizes egalitarianism. So um, the, there are systems where it, there's a lot of oral history that talks about the fall of cities and, and why it's wrong to have a king or why it's wrong to, um, to allow one leader to take too much power. Um, and so there are political systems um, among native nations that that encourage shared participation. And so there are all these rules about, say, um, it, with the Haudenosaunee, say, there's a, there's a representative government. And in their great law, they talk over and over about how important it is for representatives to, say, have um, their skin be seven times the, the thickness of other people's skin. So it's not easy to run that kind of politics. Um, but that's the kinds of things that, that Europeans don't see when they imagine this sort of simple, just living off the land. Um, and, and you bring up private property and, and it, there is, it's tremendously important that distinction between a European's view of private property, which does lead to all kinds of, of misunderstandings and taking advantage um, of, of when Europeans come in and think they've bought something for all time. Um, when Native Americans have perhaps think they're renting it, right, or are giving some sort of those temporary use um, permit to something. Um, but it's private property and a nation owning land, having land, having borders is not the same. So Native nations absolutely believed that a certain you know, part of the land belonged to one Native nation and then another part belonged to another Native nation. Um, and and had, they very often had very clear borders between them, especially if the two nations were at war. Um, so Europeans sort of take this sort of this understanding that, that that private property isn't the same within native nations. That that it is true that many families can share land, or a town can, um, um, in common, own hunting or 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 um, farming fields. Um, and, and they make it into this idea that Native Americans don't believe in property at all, that they don't believe in ownership of, of any space, um, which is not true at all. Native Americans see land, uh, see their country as being, as being their own. So indeed, uh, Kathleen, history is written by the victors. We are speaking <laughs> with a very distinguished American historian, Kathleen Duval. She has a fascinating new book out, Native Nations, a millennium in North America. We've really just skated the surface of the first 500 years but, uh, until the Europeans show up. And we're going to talk after the break about the consequences of the European uh, colonization, if that's the right word, of North America. But I want to remind everyone that great guests like Kathleen Duval are brought to us because of our friends at Liberties. Uh, excellent new quarterly of culture and politics. Going to run a short feature on liberties, and then we'll be back with Kathleen Duval to talk about the consequences of European colonization for Native Americans. So don't go away, anyone. We'll be back in a second. The noise, there is nuance, insight. Liberties, it's not just a journal of ideas. It's a meteor of intelligent substance. It's the place to be for engaged citizens. Politics, opinion, Substance. Liberties is a triumph for freedom of thought. A quarterly of urgency, of cultural exploration, of intellectual delight, of immaculate prose. It's invaluable. Subscribe now or find Liberties at your favorite bookseller. And you can subscribe to Liberties at libertiesjournal.com. We are speaking with Kathleen Duval, the author of Native Nations, the Millennium in North America. Our show has been divided into two. The idyllic period before the Europeans showed up and then the last 500 years, which uh, haven't been great, I think, generally for Native Americans. Uh, Kathleen, when the Europeans showed up, did these Native nations, did they think that they were different from any other invading peoples? Was there something substantially uh, 
different? Did they see them in, in magical terms, in religious terms? Mm -hmm. It's a good question. It's a question that, that historians have asked a lot. And I think one of the things that, um, it, it's different in different places for different people. So the first native people who saw Europeans, who saw them coming on a ship across the ocean um, with completely new kinds of goods, goods they hadn't seen before. I think those people were likely to think, this is a really strange and different kind of people. Um, and, and I should say also most people in the world saw things in sort of religious terms at the time. So, including the Europeans. Including the Europeans. So, so those, in those first encounters, both Europeans and Native Americans tried to understand each other um, in religious terms um, and, and perhaps in super, what we would call today supernatural terms. Um, but then there are other people who, there are peoples, especially farther into the continents of the Americas that their first contact with Europeans is actually through indirect is indirect. It's, it's say through some trade goods that come to them through a native trading partner. Um, and they, you know, get to know sort of, you know, metal goods and, um, things like that before they ever meet their, their first European. They certainly hear news and tales of Europeans, of what maybe their, their native allies have, have discovered about them as they've gotten to know them, those who live closer to Europeans or have had visits from Europeans on ships. And so once you move into the interior and move later um, through that 500 years uh, that, um, that European, Europeans have been in the Americas, um, there's less and less a sense that Europeans might be a completely different kind of people and more and more information about them, information about ways in which they might be useful um, and information about ways that they might be dangerous. And, and also you can imagine just lots and lots of, of uh, sort of rumors and, uh, and um, talking about, uh, about how to deal with them. Was the fundamental difference the technology of warfare? It's, I mean, it's easy to think of it that way, but because war is, war absolutely exists in North America before Europeans get here. Oh, perhaps, so, let me rephrase, I mean, the technology yeah. of violence, not just warfare, but yeah. the, so, the Europeans had the guns and the cannon. Yeah, right. So there are important differences there, but pretty soon their native trading partners in most parts of the Americas start to acquire guns either directly from Europeans or through um, native trading source, you know, native tra traders in between. Um, uh, and also to change some of the things they do to be, to better protect themselves over the, the against those kinds of weapons to um, say, stop using wooden armor, which is very effective against arrows and not very effective against guns and start using um, either using metal armor or avoiding the kind of direct battles that might um, that might be more deadly, and also you know building in different ways. So say a, a fortified town might be what you want against your enemies with uh, with bows and arrows. Um, if enemies are coming in with cannon, um, then you might just give up the fort entirely. Um, and you know, either fortification of the kinds that they had in Europe um, or give up the fort entirely and be uh, a little bit more on the move and, and ready to, to evacuate um, your towns if, if Europeans come with cannons. And, but there is, I think the one thing that I would say is harder for Native Americans to get used to um, is the potential for violence just in everyday life that, uh, that I, I don't want to, say this about Europeans generally, because it's a certain kind of European who comes to North America. Drunken Englishmen. Yeah, right. Exactly. Yeah. Drunken English men. Uh, and, uh, and they, many of them um, in the early, in the first century or so, they're, they're veterans of the wars in Ireland. Um, they've been trained to be pretty brutal. Um, and that's sort of an expectation that at least in the 1500s and early 1600s, um, that Englishmen um, bring and, and Spanish men uh, have come from their own wars in the Iberian Peninsula. Um, they're really it's it's warriors for the most part. Mm. And it's of course important to remind everyone you know, that most people won't know this that it wasn't just the British but the the French and um, and the Spanish who colonized North America. And when we talk about North America, our Canadian friends know that it's not just the United States; it's it's Canada as well. Although we tend for one reason or other to think of the history of North America in the context of the United States. Was there before the wars of independence, Kathleen, more 
coexistence between the native peoples and the European colonialists. That's again a, a common assumption, maybe a cliche, mm -hmm. and that the European powers made alliances with the native peoples in the same way as they made alliances with each other in, in Western Europe. Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, it's, you know, as you say, it's a, it's a generalization. It's certainly not true in all places and times. Um, but looking across North America for these centuries before the revolutionary period, um, Europeans just come in most places, they come in so in smaller numbers than Native Americans. And even if they have more military technology, at least at first, um, often they have to trade that military technology to get native allies, to get access to land and resources. Um, and, and they're there in much smaller numbers. And so they have to, make, it's not that they're you know, kinder people, but they have to make, in most cases, alliances with at least some native nations. And then often Europeans get pulled into wars that already are pre-existing in North America because they make allies with say one native people who says, okay, if you want to live on this land and be our, our allies, you not only have to trade guns and other things that we want to us, you also have to come with us when we go fight our enemies. So a lot of the wars that Europeans end up in the middle of in those early centuries are, um, are really native wars, wars that their native allies have pulled them into. Might it be argued then, Kathleen, that the real catastrophe, and, 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 and I don't think we can us, underestimate that word, for the native peoples wasn't the arrival of the Europeans, it was the wars of independence and the establishment of an independent United States of America? I, I think that's exactly right. And, and you know, you mentioned Canada and then we mentioned Mexico, the, the republics, uh, the Republic of Mexico and, uh, and the nation of Canada end up doing some similar things too. So it's not only the United States, but these, um, this, in the case of the United States, particularly though, though there's some, some parallels um, with Mexico and Canada as well. Um, a nation is founded at the end of the 18th century that is, um, whose members believe they have won this war against Britain in order to um, for their own independence, which depends on land. So they found a republic. Um, they look back to ancient history and see, and then more recent history, and see republics are very hard to sustain. Um, and they say, if we aren't going to have a king, if we're going to have many common men able to vote, and, and if that's where sovereignty is going to lie in the United States, um, those men need to be independent. They can't have a landlord. They can't have a boss. Um, they need their own farms. They need to be independent farmers. And that's what will give them the independence to run a republic, um, to be the virtuous citizens of a republic. And that land is, for the most part, native land. And the other reason why that's true, right there side by side uh, with the independence reasons, is that the population of the United States doubles every generation from the late years of the British colonies um, in the mid 18th century all the way to the 20th century. Every generation for over a century doubles the population of the United States. And if that, if that population, if the, the free men of that population are gonna own land, um, that land is going to come from Native Americans and it is going to be easier and easier for the United States to force Native Americans to abandon that land as their population grows. So it's a, it's a vicious cycle for, um, for Native Americans at the same time that it might be a virtuous cycle um, for the growth and expansion and prosperity of the United States. Kathleen, we probably should have done this show on July 4th. It's an appropriate conversation, particularly yes. given uh, today's atmosphere in America. Was there a Native American voice in any of the constitutional assemblies? Uh, were there the, the so-called founding fathers? Hamilton, Madison, Jefferson, Washington. Did they have any sense or sensibility about the native peoples in terms of in, including them in this new republic? Yeah, they did. And, and I think it's really important to remember that even that late, even at the end of the 18th century, to um, Americans, to the founding fathers as to other Americans, Native Americans are still in their own nations, right? They are, there are some Native Americans that live within colonies at that point and what become states, but the vast majority of Native nations live in their own nations. They're Cherokees or they're Shawnees, um, they're Mohawks. They um, 
Indian policy in the late 18th century and the beginning of the 19th century is foreign policy. Um, Indian policy is put under the Department of War, which is the, the predecessor of the Department of State. Um, the mentions of Native Americans in the Declaration of Independence and the Constitution um, have to do with foreign policy. And so um, there is a sense among founding fathers that they have won a great deal of land in defeating the British in the American Revolution. Um, but they also recognize that that land is occupied, not just by human beings, but by nations. And that to get that land, they will have to do what you do if you want another nation's land. They will have to fight wars against them. The G word, uh, tragically, Kathleen, is very controversial these days, genocide. Uh, it's been used to describe the behavior of North Americans, uh, colonialists or the independent, uh, independent Americans towards Native Americans, particularly in the context, uh, I think, of Andrew Jackson. Mm -hmm. What happened in this period? I, 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 is it appropriate to use this word to describe the way in which Native Americans were treated in this early history of, of populist democracy? in the early yeah. 19th century yeah i think it's it's certainly a good word to think with and it applies you know very well to sometimes in places and arguably well to others and it and i think you know some of the essential things to remember about genocide are it can be true even if it doesn't succeed right just because there are native americans and native nations today doesn't mean um that it wasn't genocide or it wasn't genocide you know genocidal impulse. Um, and also that while there are certainly times when colonialists have tried to kill off Native Americans, there have been even more times when they've tried to destroy them as cultures, as nations. Um, and so there can be you know, an element to genocide that is not just physical death, but it's also um, the repeated periods in, in the history of the United States in which the United States government and state governments have tried to destroy native nations as polities, as cultures, as communities. Um, and so you know, I think it's, it's, it's a word to be careful with, um, but it's also a really useful word when, when, when looking at the kind of, of the kinds of things that some people were um, prepared to do um, to other people. Some people, are you talking about Andrew Jackson and Jacksonian right, so democracy? Yeah, yeah. So Andrew Jackson, for example, certainly um, he sees himself as he's, he's elected by white American, white American men. Um, he does not see himself responsible to Native Americans. And this is, this is a transition period between the U.S. government seeing Native nations um, and acting with Native nations as if they are um, entirely separate and sovereign countries, which is, is the way they did at the beginning, as I was talking about before, um, into treating them as, as dependents um, with, with few who are part of the United States um, and, and yet have very few rights within the United States. So Native Americans at the time of, of Jackson in the early 19th century, most Native Americans have no desire to be part of the United States. They want to still be separate Native nations um, and have the United States only be part of the continent, right? Um, and, and so Andrew Jackson is part of a movement that, um, that declares in the early 19th century that Native nations have no rights as nations anymore. Um, and that therefore um, the federal government um, can uh, remove, they, they still make treaties with them, although they're forced treaties. So there's still this recognition that they are in some way sovereign, um, but can force them into treaties and then physically force them to leave their homelands and move west. So, so yeah, I, th I think, you know, we could argue, you know, people can argue about, about whether, what parts of the definition of genocide fit that and won't, do and which don't. Um, but, uh, but certainly the impulse behind it, um, the uh, assumption that, that it's okay for one country to treat another that way, um, and, uh, and some of the effects so do, do seem to fit that word pretty well. Was that racial? Was that uh, rooted in in a racialized notion of Native Americans, or a religious notion, a cultural one, a gendered one? It, it, it's certainly cultural, um, and uh, sort of the the height of white supremacy and racism in the United States comes a little bit later than that, but it is certainly growing and, and existing in the early nineteenth century, um, and it 
It is. If you sort of read, say, Jackson's speeches, the way he or, or say the governor of Georgia at the time is putting a lot of pressure on the Cherokees, for example, they do. They talk about Native. They certainly talk about Native Americans, not as nations. And they talk about individual Native Americans as um was incapable of civilization. So if we, you know, we talked earlier about Europeans or Europeans, even from you know, those, the, those first centuries when they're coming to the Americas, they see, they, they believe Native Americans are primitive, um, but they don't necessarily believe Native Americans can never become like Europeans. So, so they're kind of wrong about the long history of, of, of the Americas. Um, and they are absolutely, Europeans are absolutely ethnocentric in believing that everybody should be like Europeans, but they don't yet have that sort of that extremely racist view that um, that people who uh, who aren't of European, uh, of 100% European descent um, can never be civilized or can never be part of a, um, some place like the United States that, that they actually need to be entirely removed um, or enslaved. Speaking of enslavement, Kathleen, uh, the Americans, of course, white Americans brought their own, I guess, quote unquote, native nations with them as African slaves. Was there, did this, the institution of slavery exist ever in, in the peoples of North America, the native peoples? And, and, and what did they make of of, of slavery, was there a degree of competition between the African slaves and the Native Americans in terms of who was explo exploiting to, who was who was bottom of the chain? It's the histories are so different from each other. So, so first, was just sort of to answer the sort of oldest part of of the question, there absolutely is uh, captivity and slavery within Native American societies. It's of the kind that, say, if we went back to our uh, our ten fifty four example, it's the kind of captivity and slavery you could have found all around the world in that period. I mean, slavery comes essentially from the question, what, what do you do with somebody you capture in war, the, the, who isn't killed in war? Um, you take them prisoner, and then what do you do with them? That's, that's sort of where slavery comes from. Um, and so in Native North America, just like all around the world, you could find people who were enslaved, they'd been ripped from their homes during warfare and held captive by an enemy, right? <laughs> Slavery is never good, right? It's never good for the person under it. Um, but like all over the world, and pretty much I think in, in 1054, it wasn't necessarily inherited by their children. It wasn't race-based. Um, it uh, um, was very, very little, if at all, like what you might see in plantation slavery of the early 19th century. Um, so this is the kind of slavery that Native Americans have, and, it, and it's still kind of the kind of slavery that Europeans have when, when Europeans first, uh, first arrive. Um, but then the kind of plantation that Europeans bring with them the idea and grow tremendously the idea of plantation slavery. Um, and that's, uh, that's quite different from what Native Americans have practiced in the past. Now, there's some, there are some individual Native Americans and Native American families within some tribes, like the Cherokees and the Chickasaws, um, who do then end up by the 19th century having plantations, um, owning, holding large numbers of, of African slaves. And, and so you can certainly see that as a time when um, uh, the Native Americans who owned slaves were certainly more exploiting the enslaved, the people they enslaved than they were being exploited. Although that's- uh, Did they have a sense, Kathleen, then of, if not the injustice of racial slavery, certainly the oddity of it? Yeah, yeah. And if you, much like people of European descent as slavery arose and entrenched itself um, and eventually was abolished, Native Americans disagreed with each other about it. Some thought it was perfectly fine. Some were, you know, had quite racist beliefs about people, developed quite racist beliefs about people of African descent and believed it was perfectly fine to enslave them. Others thought this was an abhorrent practice that Europeans had brought to the continent that they didn't want any part of. Um, and so those debates raged within Native nations just the same way that they did within the United States and Mexico and Canada. How catastrophic then was the period the hundred years after jacksonian democracy so it's it, it's the worst right it, it actually um indian removal happens 
um, large, large numbers of, of nations um, and of individuals, families um, are forced, forced off their homes, they lose their homelands, they lose their, um, their houses and farms and get moved to a foreign place, often sort of right on top of each other and on top of native land belonging to Native Americans who already live there, the wars that come out of all of that. Um, then they start to rebuild. They're mostly moved as communities and resettle as communities. They start to rebuild their, um, their politics, their governments, their schools. Um, and then there's a period in the late 19th century, the end of the 19th century, early 20th century, that many, many Native people point to as actually the worst, the most genocidal time in American history, the height of white supremacy, when, um, when the US government purposely tried to destroy native nations. Uh, boarding schools took native children forcibly from their homes, from their parents and their grandparents, uh, forbade them from speaking their native languages or, or um, wearing uh, their native clothes or wearing their hair in their uh, native styles, really tried to make these children into Americans, you know, not necessarily equal Americans in those cases that uh, treated as, as people who might be a permanent domestic workforce. Um, and uh, at the same time, uh, reservations were, many reservations were allotted, were cut up, um, more land taken away, um, communal land holding, which had long been the basis of Native economies and Native social structures, um, was forbidden in many places. Um, and, and so really, it's the late 19th century and early 20th century that is the hardest period for Native Americans and Native nations to survive. Is this, in your view, a profoundly shameful chapter? The shameful, I mean, alongside slavery, of course, and rather tasteless, but is, is there a deep sense of guilt for you as a historian in terms of when you teach your, your students and when you write your books? Uh, and should we... Should we be thinking about reparations in terms of the, the, the crimes committed against these native peoples in, in the hundred years uh, uh, after Jacksonian democracy? Yeah, uh, that's, uh, in some ways it's a period where if you think about the Civil War, the Civil War is fought over slavery. It's fought by many people to end slavery, it ends end slavery and there are many reformers who come out of the civil war who want to do right by native nations too um and you know, history is unpredictable it goes in different ways and instead of moving toward a more egalitarian um, society or a society that expanded citizenship in the in the second half of the 19th century um, instead the united states goes in the other direction cracks down on some of the progress that black citizens had made and um, institutes just a series of oppressive measures against all kinds of people that are seen on white. And um, that's what to me is, is the saddest um, and if you will, the worst part of that era is that um, it just seems like a period when things could have and should have gone in the other direction. Um, and they didn't, they, they got worse for a lot of people. And, and so I think, you know, one of the things that the United States and many other nations are gonna need to struggle with is um, how can we understand this history right? And how can we um, also think about all its links to the present day and and what it, the, the inequalities uh, in our society today that come out of this long history of, of colonialism and slavery. You had an interesting piece, Kathleen, recently um, in The Atlantic. Uh, uh, entitled The 600-Year-Old Blueprint for Weathering Climate Change, in which you seem to suggest that in our, in our age of climate crisis, we have much to learn from Native Americans. Is there any truth to that? So I'm a historian, and I am much more comfortable in say, with saying what people in the past did, right or wrong or in between, um, than in having any idea of what anybody should do in the present. Um, but I do think it's interesting that in this time of, of a, in that case, a, a planet that was getting colder, um, in 
and when it was getting harder for people to grow large amounts of food and cities fell, um, that what came in their aftermath was, was a, were societies that put more value on, on sharing, on reciprocity, on equality. Not, and you know, we've talked a long time about how they had wars with other people. It's not that they, that all was sunny and great, but within their societies and often with their allies, um, they decided at some point that it was safer and more prosperous to get along and to share uh, in a sort of reciprocal way um, than to try to take advantage of, of other people within their society or that they were um, you know, allies with. And I, I suspect nobody would have predicted that that's the way things were going to go if you'd asked people living in cities in 1054. And I know there was a lot of trauma in between that it wasn't an easy, people just one day decided, well, let's just get along better. And then they stopped having the huge droughts and problems feeding with themselves that they had before. It didn't happen that quickly. And it happened with a, you know, a lot of death and a lot of trauma. Um, so I'm not sure it's a path that's going to be super easy for us either. Um, but I think it's at least interesting, if not helpful, to reflect that uh, there are different ways that societies can go. There are times in history when things, um, when people treat each other worse. And there are times when maybe people um, think about if we treated each other a little bit better, um, maybe life would be easier for all of us. Final question, Kathleen. Um, this is millen uh, a millennium in North America in, in 2024, are there, can we still talk about native nations or native peoples in America? I've been to a couple of these, what, what are called reservations, which I found to be enormously depressing places of poverty, uh, very different from the rest of America. Are there native nations left? We've done a number of shows with people who have written on it. I sometimes suspect there's a degree of wishful thinking here. And if there are, how many native peoples are left uh, in, Amer in the America, the United States, and, and indeed Canada, where I know perhaps there's a little bit more uh, of a sense of responsibility and guilt for what happened uh, well, there are um, there are a couple million uh, Native Americans in the United States today. Um, there are almost 600 federally recognized tribes, plus uh, many more, plus more state recognized tribes, and they do um, they do have their own governments. Um, I think what is useful maybe to think about them as being more on the level of say a state government um, and doing a lot of the kinds of things that in the United States a county or town government would do. Um, so social services for their own peoples, um, taking over uh, health, health services, running hospitals, um, tribal businesses, um, banks, small business loans to their people. Um, so it, there really actually is a, quite a renaissance going on in Native America these days. Um, and, and it's based within Native nations, lots of um, cultural revitalization, uh, linguistic revitalization. Um, so in many ways, it's, it's, it's a time you know, when really that that level of sovereignty and uh, and governance is on the rise as, as well as as, as in art and, and all kinds of things that are more obvious to people. And one of the things I always say is like you think of a tribe and uh, look at their website and you'll see on their website they'll have a little bit about their history um, but more of it is about sort of just daily life, providing services for their own people. And that's what governments do, right? So um, you can look on a tribal website and there'll be things about their childcare centers and their social services. And if you looked at some of the bills that passed uh, US Congress in the last couple of years uh, with say COVID relief or infrastructure funding, um, right at the beginning of those bills are, this funding is gonna flow through states tribal governments, counties and towns. So they really are, you know, part of the sort of political structure of the United States. And I don't think that's going away anytime soon, but that's, a, that, that's something that, that, uh, that outsiders don't notice that much, um, how important they are to tribal members in that way. And of course, um, most Native Americans don't live on reservations these days. They are just in all the same places that, that all other Americans are.
And finally, finally, uh, Kathleen, I'm guessing you're no great fan of Donald Trump. Um, the more you talk about it, the more it seems as if Trump's attitude towards, quote unquote, illegal immigration is rather like the way in which the Europeans treated the original native peoples. What can we learn uh, as, as Americans in the 2020s? from the native peoples as we confront and try to deal with the whole question of land and immigration? Mm -hmm. um, I think it's hard to take lessons from the past, right? Because uh, one, one thing we might say if we were going back in the past is to tell Native Americans not to let a single European in, right? <laughs> Which would be- Well, they didn't probably right? have much choice, did they? <laughs> right. right, well, at first yeah, they did, they traded and they, yeah, they, they did um, oftentimes. Um, so, so I don't know. Uh, yeah, I, I find it hard to, to take lessons from the past, except for just a little bit of humility um, and, uh, and just trying to, trying to know that people are different from each other and uh, we all have to try to live on this planet together.